Hey there, my name is Tiffany and I serve as the worship pastor here at Without Walls Church. And before we jump into this week's message, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us and being a part of our online family. Make sure you hit that subscribe button because we would love the opportunity to come alongside you and help you as you further your walk with Christ. But we pray that this week's message challenges you, encourages you, and equips you to be all that God has called you to be. Have a great week. I've got my trusty board. This is my last week because this is the last message in the series called uh, Empowered to Rise. And I did a little bit different last, uh, than last week because they said they couldn't see everything last week because I had a uh, little thin magic marker. So I asked them to get me a fatter one, and they got me the jumbo. I mean, this stinker is like, uh, this will mark your face up in one swath right across, but we got it. I'm not going to do a lot of marking anyway, but... Uh, <clears throat> You know, it's interesting when we talk about, there's been a lot of, of uh, talk about the, uh, the revival, okay, Asbury uh, College. And um, what I find interesting, because I've, I've been around a little while, and I've been in the, church, um, in the church ministry for quite a few years, and we've seen a lot of these. Uh, we see a lot of things that happen where a move of God will take place in a in a specific area at a specific time. There's really no rhyme or reason to it. It's just a particular move. And you can say, well, maybe those people were set up differently and ready for something different than, you know, what somebody over here was. And that's possible. Uh, the thing is, is that you don't, you don't ever understand why things happen just the way they do. But I also know this, is that, is that when everything begins to be isolated to just a geographic location, a lot of times in the beauty and the strength of, of an outpouring or a, uh, man, a manifestation of God's presence, oftentimes the natural gets involved to where people think, well, I've got to get there to meet God, and they miss him here. They miss him where they're at. And, and there, there's nothing wrong with going to a place. There's nothing wrong. In fact, I just, we just found out that, I mean, most of you probably have heard this, Asbury, uh, they've cut their stopping the public uh, gatherings in two days, uh, they got school. They, they got their students that have paid for school to come and learn, and, and so they've got to keep going. So it happened for a time, and there was a purpose for it. Um, but, but there's a time that I think that people have to come to a realization that what takes place in a moment is not limited to a moment. It's, 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 it is unlimited to your lifetime. And, and some of the things that we've actually even been talking about here over the past few weeks. I mean, even with Bob and Audrey last week and kind of talking uh, uh, more uh, on the relationship side of things and the marriage side of things, they, uh, they really addressed these things. Even when Isaiah was here, he addressed these things because it's consistent all the way through. It requires a lifestyle of repentance. Repentance is not forgiveness. Repentance is changing your mind. So you don't, do, you don't just repent one time you live really in a, in a measure or a level of repentance every day because if your mind is being changed and if it is being washed with the water of the word and is being renewed, you can't help. You can't help but have a recalibration and a resetting going on up here constantly. So what you believed last week, it's possible that this week may take on a whole different picture because of something that you received from this. Now, if you're not getting into this, then you're not getting renewed and you're staying the same. So repentance pretty much is nil. I'm just going to tell you that. The only way that you repent isn't, isn't a decision of, okay, I think I can, I think I can, now I'm going to do it. Repentance is a shift of a mindset. It's a belief system that is transferred over from one aspect to a complete other aspect. You've been believing one way for this long, or you thought this about that, or, or you agreed that this was the way this is, and all of a sudden you realize that that's not what it was, and you shifted your mindset, and now that begins to direct your steps. That's repentance. It's a change of mind. And where your mind goes, your life goes. So in talking about empowered to rise, we, we got in these last couple messages, we got into the fact that the battle, the battle is, is, is in your mind. And the battle, and this, this is a person. This board is a person, okay? And thank God we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye, you know, but one someday. But this is a person. So your soul, your, here comes my big one. Your soul, can you see that? Hey, look at there. Is your mind, your spirit is your 
anointing. Is that how you spell it? If it isn't, it is now. Uh, and your body, your body is your flesh. Okay? So when we look at a life, my life, your life, this is what we see. You have a spirit, you, or you are a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body. Okay, this is your God consciousness, this is your self consciousness, this is your world consciousness. This is what gives you the connection to the natural world we live in. This, what gives, this is what gives you the connection to God, what you sense like in a moment, like earlier today, it, people sense they can feel, they can feel a stirring. And it, it, it's this part of your, uh, of your being as a believer is being stirred up and it's connecting with the things of God. And this right here is being fed from here, but it's also being fed from here. Which one wins is going to be determined upon you. So as we begin to look at this whole thing, today to capsulize and to bring home this whole series, Empowered to Rise, I, I, I just want to just package it up, try to make it very palatable for you, and that you can see and you can understand and then you can apply. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. 2 Corinthians 10. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out. Of, I'm going to read this portion of Scripture out of the New King James, and then I'm going to read it out of the Passion Translation. I'm going to show you the difference of it. Here's, here's what it says out of New King James, okay? For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, let me take that and read it to you in the Passion Translation. This will give you a different, a different uh, perspective of it. For although we live in the natural realm, we don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. We can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture, like prisoners of war, every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to the Anointed One. Since we are armed with such a dynamic weaponry, we stand ready to punish in any trace of rebellion as soon as you choose complete obedience. So it's always contingent on your position, on your obedience. So God is, God is already telling us that there's something different between what he put in us and the way that we think. And, and it's that way that we think that has created the conflict and the, the confusion that we find ourselves dealing with most of the time. And by the way, that can manifest in any area of your life. It's the way you think about your wife, the way you think about your husband, your marriage, the way you think about your kids and your home life. It's the, the way you think about yourself and, and how you look or how you appear. It's the way you think about your job and the people you work with or the, the boss that you work under. It's the way you think about the country you live in. It's the way you think about the church. It's the way that you think about God. In other words, it can come through. It, those things drive every phase of our life. But in Colossians 3, we read this a few weeks ago, the third, chap the third chapter, third verse, Paul said this, for you died, he's speaking to believers now, he said, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. Christ means what? What does Christ mean? Anointing, all right? So remember that, because I'm gonna ask you again. So you're with Christ in God. So everything that you could ever be, you already are. And that did not happen the moment you got saved. But you were created in Christ, in the anointing, before the foundations of the world, Ephesians says. Before God ever said, let there be light. You were in his mind. You were on his heart. You were in him. So God had a plan. He had a purpose for you. He had a reason for you being born into this earth. He had assignments for you to live out. 
And the only way that you could discover what those were was contingent on you realizing that you were lost and that you needed a savior. And the moment that you received Christ, that you received the anointing, this part of you that was dead because of Adam's rebellion in the garden, the moment you made the decision to follow Christ, this part of you came alive unto God. And also, what else came alive was the purpose, the plans, and the assignments that God predestined for you before the foundations of the world. Now, here's the thing that you have to remember is that Jesus told his disciples that the Holy Spirit would not only lead them and guide them into all truth, but that the Holy Spirit would reveal what was to come. Now, reveal means it already exists. In other words, if I'm going to reveal something to you today, that means that whether it's intellectually or if it was even tangibly, that means I already possess it. I've got it. It exists already. All I'm going to do is I'm going to open up and I'm going to, I'm going to reveal it, unveil it to you this morning. But also in John 16, it probably explains a little bit better in the Passion Translation, verse 13. But when the truth-giving spirit comes... He will unveil the reality of every truth within you. He won't speak on his own, but only what he hears from the Father. And he will reveal prophetically to you what is to come. So, my spirit, my spirit knows who I am, but my, my mind is broken. Why? Because Adam ate from the tree in the garden that God told him not to eat of. As a matter of fact, Romans, the fifth chapter, says that through one man, meaning Adam, that sin entered the world and a broken mind was the result of that. And therein is the problem. Because as a man thinks, so is he. So if I forfeit my God life, the, the life that God put inside of me, because I refuse to change the way I think, then listen, I will arrive at the destination of my thoughts and I will forfeit my God life because I won't take my mind and reset it. See, when we, when we talk about that scripture, as a man thinks in his heart, that's not talking about all of the random thoughts, that, the thousands of thoughts that can flow through our mind in a day. But it's the thoughts that, that we embrace and meditate on that become a pattern of thinking. And it's that pattern of thinking, or in other words, that consistency of thinking that becomes our belief system. Our belief system is what drives and motivates how we walk and, and how we carry out life. Now, a couple weeks ago, we talked uh, about what Paul the Apostle said in Romans 12. He said, don't be conformed to this world. Remember, the world is not the earth. The world is me, the word world means the systems that function on the earth and the patterns of thinking that govern the systems that are on the earth. Do you understand that, that we are living in a world where sometimes people get a little bit skewed and sometimes we can become so casual and routine just like Tiffany was talking about earlier and we don't even realize how it is that we are thinking or how it is that we're acting because it's become such a part of, of our lives and, and how we function. And, and you don't know how worldly your thinking is until the word of God opposes it. Listen, church, we live in a society right now where it's all about don't offend anybody. I mean, the extremes of what to say and how to say it and when to say it and what's politically correct and what's not. Man, it's at an all-time high like never before. As a matter of fact, there are people, there are organizations right now that have labeled this book, the Bible, as hate speech. And there are people that are buying in to that pattern of thinking. But the fact is that really shouldn't surprise us because... The, the, the further that a society drifts from the truth, the more they hate those who speak it. See, in, in 1 Peter 2, it says that Jesus is the rock of offense, but it's to those who are disobedient to the word. So if you hear something or read something out of this book and it makes you mad, or are you, are you, you start rising up with thoughts of opposition to it, that this can't be right, 
Let me tell you something. You're on the wrong side of the fence. Because when I start picking and choosing out of here what I like and what I think is right, I'm not embracing Jesus. Really what I'm doing is I'm creating a Jesus that fits my lifestyle and my preferences, and that will always lead to destruction. Always. So understand that when I'm speaking to you, it isn't really about right and wrong. It's, it's about a kingdom life. It's, it's about a blessed life. And, and Jesus said in Matthew, the seventh chapter, the 13th verse, you know, this is, this is really, uh, it's really gripping if you think about it, because it really puts all the responsibility on us and the choice is always on us. But in verse 13 of chapter seven, he said, wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many are going to go down that road. So you can live any old way you want to. You can take this book and you can pick and choose and you, know, you can manufacture any kind of gospel that fits your lifestyle. I mean, just go ahead. You can do it. But let me tell you something. It will lead to destruction. It's a, it's a wide road and it's easy to go down. And the sad part is, is that most people are going to choose that way. But then in the next verse, verse 14, Jesus goes on and takes a little bit deeper. He says, but narrow is the gate and difficult is the way. No, I don't like difficult. I don't want to. I don't want to go down that road. But that's the road that leads to the life that God has destined for you. And that is exactly why he says in that verse, few are going to find it. Few. Few. So every time that I, I take this book and I ingest it, I, I read it, I allow, I allow, it's not the fact that I've got the book, the, the leather binding and the white pages with black ink. This isn't your sword of the spirit, okay? This is, this is a book that houses the words of God. It is God breathed, the Holy Spirit breathed through men as they penned these words. But it's when these words come off the page and get embedded in my life and they transform my thinking, that's when it becomes the sword of the Spirit. And then when it, then when it is delivered out of your life through your mouth and your words begin to dictate who you are and what you've got and, and what your authority is in the earth, man, that's all Jesus did. Just look at his life. Everything he wanted, he spoke. Man, he spoke to the wind the waves. It was there. He spoke to a fig tree, died, and it died. Man, he, he speaks to Lazarus who is dead, a dead corpse. He speaks, says, come forth. The life comes back into the body. He did it with his words. It didn't say he ran into the tomb. He said, move that rock. I'm going to go lay my hands on Lazarus, that body right now in Jesus' name. No, he just spoke, said, Lazarus, come forth. It was the authority of the word. It was what he had in him. And that's what we've got. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, it's in us. We got it. We've got it. But if you don't transform your thinking and you embrace that pattern of thought, then you're never going to function in it, even though it's available to you every single day. So we go on and we look at things and we see the word, we hear people talk about it, we read it here and there, and it's a matter of shifting and changing our mindset. So every time I take this, this word into my life, it is resetting something that's broken. And by the way, that's not always a real comfortable process. How, how many of you have ever broken a bone and had to have it reset? Any, anybody in here? How, you understand that's not like your top three things that you want to experience in life. Okay. But, but when you set that bone back, if it's an arm or leg or whatever, before they cast it and they get that thing aligned up and they cast it, Doctors will tell you that that bone will mend and heal back stronger than it even was before, just because of the, the body's healing process. So God is letting us know that your life and who you were created to be is in your anointing, but your mind doesn't know. So going back to what Paul said in, in Romans 12, verse 2, he said, don't be conformed to this world. 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what that's telling us then is that transformation doesn't happen when you're saved. Transformation only happens when you renew or reset your mind. That's what it says. That's why you have a lot of people <clears throat> who call themselves Christians, or, and I'm not debating if they are or they aren't, I'm just telling you, that will call themselves Christians because they, they pray to a prayer to receive Christ, but they have not, they have not taken the step then to allow the word to transform their thinking. So what happens is they only know God is savior. They don't know him as Lord, but they'll go around saying, well, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Well, that's not just because you invited him into your heart. If he's Lord, that means, that means he's a, the governor over every phase of your life. There is nothing that's yours. There's nothing that you can't release. Everything that you have is from him. If he told you to go out and give your car to somebody, you know, hopefully you give the payment along with it, but no, <laughs> that you just do it. You just do it. There's no questions that you are obedient. He's, he is Lord over your life. And, and, and Romans 8, 7 says that the carnal mind is the enemy of God and, and it cannot submit to God, nor will it. So, so what that really is saying is that if you have a mind that still thinks worldly and you have an anointing that thinks godly, that even, even if your anointing is crying out the next desires of God for your life, your mind can squash it and shut it down. Which is where we find a lot of frustrated believers today. So the big question, why am I here? The answer to that is found right here. But this doesn't know. He doesn't know. And as we know what's crazy is that most people will try to discover it here. And there's not a person you can talk to. There's not another book you can read. There is not another class you can take that will tell you your destiny. The only one that knows your destiny is God. That's why the Holy Spirit is called a teacher. He's inside of you, inside of you. Now, let me show you something again out of 2 Corinthians 10, out of the New King James Version. That said, it said, for though, though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. Okay, so it's not about people, even though you'd love to make it about people, okay? Well, it's this woman that you gave me. That's what Adam said. It started in the garden. You know, I mean, Adam threw her under the bus. You know, I mean, we know that. But, but he was a skirt. He was the one that should have stood up and said, hey, snake, I'm going to wring your little neck. You, ain't, you leave my wife alone. And he should have taken the spot, and, and he didn't. But the fact is, is that it, it begins that way. We, look in, we start looking at people to be the justification for why things aren't right with us. And so we look at things like this, and, and, and it, it, it wasn't about fleshly things. And he goes on to say, for the weapons of our warfare. In other words, you, he's telling you, you're going to be battling some stuff all the time. There, there's, all, always, there's always a, a battle. Because this guy here, this guy here is always feeding him. Oh, this feels so good. Oh, that looks good. Oh, that, ooh, did you smell that? Oh, that. And he's feeding this information into your soul. And it's going to be here that you're going to make the determination of what's going to be played out in your life. But the whole time here, your spirit is also feeding godly things. No, don't, don't do that. Don't look at that. No, don't, don't go to that environment. Don't do this. And so the battle is, the battle rages right here. And this is, what we're, this is what we have every morning. And when you get up out of bed every morning, you can be assured. You can say, well, I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, you better be sure the enemy's going to be throwing his tool chest of stuff at you, trying to make you bite and latch on to something that's going to mess you up and confuse you and frustrate you. And you're going to walk out the door. Well, I'm a believer, but I don't feel very victorious today because you're looking for victory. You're not living from victory. And it's a whole different mindset, but it's the change of mind. It's the recalibrating. It's the renewing. It's the resetting of your mind. So he goes on, he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So if my mind needs to be transformed, what is it that I'm fighting? 
Because if I could just see my enemy, I could beat him. Your enemy is never more lethal than when you can't see him. Or you don't know his, his MO, or you don't know his tactics. And so what 2 Corinthians 10 is telling us, he, he's showing you who your enemy is and how he works. Now look at this. The first thing he mentions is that you are fighting strongholds. Stronghold. A stronghold is when you have believed a lie to be true. Okay, so God is the only one that knows who you really are. That's in your anointing. But your mind is fighting these lies. And those lies then become a pattern of thinking. Let me show you an example. Let's say, for instance, uh, this microphone's bugging me a little bit today for some reason. Must be my head must have grown over the week. <clears throat> Let's say, for instance, you're a young child, okay? And you get and experience the seed of rejection. Let's, let's say that it happens because your parents separated and divorced and you ended up living with your mom and your dad said, son or, or daughter, whatever. He said, I'm, I'm going to come and every weekend is yours and mine. I'm going to come pick you up. I'm gonna, we're, it, we're, we're gonna, we are going to, man, I'm going I'm to be in your life. I'm going to be part of your life. And, and it starts off that way and it starts off good. But then after time, there's something comes up and he has to cancel. And then all of a sudden, one week turns into two weekends. And, and all of a sudden, there's spans of time that maybe things are happening. And, and now all of a sudden, wow, now, you, you know, it's, it's weeks at a time. Maybe you're only seeing them once every month. And, and you start to feel like your dad doesn't love you, doesn't, doesn't care about you. He doesn't value you. And people around you are trying to say, listen, no, he loves you. He's just, he's just busy. He's got to do this. And, they, and, and you hear what they're saying and you try to process that. But deep down, you're, you're thinking if he really valued me and loved me, then he would find a way to spend time with me. And so that seed gets sown in at, at, at a young age. And then, then you're in elementary school and, you know, the, you're at recess time. And now they're picking teams for dodgeball and they pick captains and the captains start picking everybody. And when everybody's picked, then you're the last one standing. And you're the one that feels that rejection already. You're embarrassed already. And they, they say, okay, we'll take you. You know, you come on our team. And, and you're feeling that. And, and then your, your, your 11th birthday, you know, your, your, your mom invites all the kids from the class over, you know, for a big birthday bash. And only two people show up. And you begin to, you feel this again. And like people don't care. Or you're not valued in any way. And then when you get into high school, you and your friends go out for the track team. Man, <laughs> it is great. Your friends make the track team. And afterwards, the coach pulls you over and says, have you, have you considered marching band? And, and you, you, don't, you don't know, but you're feeling that because now you're feeling that rejection again. You've been shunned in, in some way. And, and then you find a boyfriend or you find a girlfriend and oh, you're feeling a little bit good about yourself. And then they dump you for one of your other buds. And, and now you're feeling rejection again. And, and then when you get into your career, you know you're more qualified than anyone else for that position, for that job. But yet they end up taking somebody less qualified with less experience. And now you... You, you've got this pattern of thinking, this seed that started early on, but has just been built up and built up and built up, and it stirs till now you have convinced yourself that nobody values you and nobody loves you. And what began with just one thought, one thought, now the enemy has opened up his tool's chest and he's throwing everything he can get at you, just seeing what more you'll latch on to as you progress in years. What began as one thought has now become a pattern of thinking. Nobody loves me. But that's a lie. Because John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, nobody's left out, would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. How can you say that nobody loves you when Jesus himself willingly laid his life down for you? How can you say that? But see, these are strongholds. These, these are lies. They're the enemy. They are the opposition of God. The carnal mind is the enemy of God. 
Then he goes to another level. In verse 5, he says, casting down arguments. See, now, that's something in your mind that argues with God. You may not even see it outwardly. But in your mind, it's like, nah, 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 nah. It's just going right. Say, for example, <clears throat> Rob was just up here a moment ago and, you know, sharing some, some uh, exhortation on, on tithing and the importance of, of, of keeping God first in your life as a whole, in every phase of your life, and that includes your money, includes your resources. And, and so the, through the tithe and the offerings, and, man, we, we see the blessing and we see the promises of God and, and, and just keeping him first and establishing that covenant and not shaking from it. And, and while he's talking, some of you are nodding, just like some of you are nodding your head right now. But inside you're saying, mm -mm, but he doesn't know my situation. No, but, but you know, he doesn't know where I'm at right now. He doesn't, and God, what, you know, God knows my heart. Dude, he does know your heart better than you know your heart. And you know, you say, well, I tried tithing for six weeks in a row and nothing happened. As if God is your employee and you gave him a job and he muffed it, he didn't show up, you know? What, what is that about? I mean, the fact is this, is, you know, people will even go as far as to say, well, when I start making more money, then I'll start giving to God. Where is that in the Bible? Man, so, so the thing is this, is we, we see these things and somebody be, uh, can be on the platform exhorting you with the word of God and you're nodding your head and the whole time inside you're, battling, you're, you're arguing with God and justifying why it can't be done right now in your life. Someday I will. And evidently maybe you don't feel that that blessing is meant for you. But th these are arguments. It just happens all the time. Then, then he goes on to a, another level. And he says, there are high things. So you've got strongholds, you've got arguments, and you've got high things, which are all different forms of thoughts that are hunting for shelter. They're looking for a place to call home. And Solomon, who was the wisest man that ever lived, he, uh, he wrote most of Proverbs as well as the book of Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. <clears throat> and he wrote these words, and we've even mentioned this before. He said, in all of your getting, get understanding. Now, understanding actually means to stand under. So you, you have to watch what you are taking your stance under. In all of your getting get understanding. You got you to watch the information that, that yeah, you stand under because whatever you deem to be true or the truth, that will define your reality. That's how you'll make your decisions. That's how you'll perceive yourself, how you'll perceive people, how you'll perceive God it, as on what you think truth is. I, uh, over the years, here. I know a lot of new people are, are here now. And uh, man, we're, we're honored that you have uh, chosen to be a part of uh, Without Walls Church. <clears throat> but I've explained and I've taught in past that in the Bible, that light means knowledge and darkness uh, means ignorance. In Activate Level 2, you've been hearing some of this already in, in, your, in that Level 2 session, because I touch on some of that in there as well. So light is knowledge and darkness is ignorance. So like in Isaiah, the ninth chapter, it says that the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. So it's not saying that people were like out in the jungle in the dark and somebody put on a torch and they could see. What it's saying is that the people are walking without knowledge of the truth. So, so they're, they're, they're blinded and, and, and then something takes place that exposes them to, they, they receive a revelation of the knowledge of truth, and now things change. Even in 1 Peter 2, it says that, that we are a chosen generation, a holy uh, nation, a royal priesthood, a, a peculiar or God's own unique people, and that we should show forth the praises of him who has called us out of ignorance into his marvelous revelation of knowledge, the truth, because it's truth that changes things. See, God doesn't want you to be ignorant of the truth. 
Jesus didn't tell his disciples that the truth would make them free. That's not what he said. He said, you will, what? You will have knowledge of the truth. And it's that truth that will make you free. See, this is truth right here. I can say, I can, I can stand up here and say, folks, this is truth. Come and get it. But the only way you're going to get it is when you open it up and you receive it. So you can carry it around all day long. You can hold it close to your breast, chest, whatever. We go. I won't go there. The, you can carry it by your side. You can keep it in your car. This, this doesn't change anything until it gets in here and transforms this. So the thing is this, is the critical the issue, I think, that maybe I, wanna, I want you guys to understand today is that this is probably the most important thing, the only thing that changes your thinking, the only thing that will truly empower you to rise is going to be the renewing of your mind with the washing of water of the Word. Do you know what Jesus said in Matthew, <clears throat> I believe it was 6th chapter, is it right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So in chapter 6, he's talking about treasures and different things like that and, you know, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then even after, he talks a little bit more about serving God and mammon and, and those type of things. But, but it was right, right in the middle of that, he makes this, this statement in about two or three scriptures that some people may look at it and say it's odd where it was put in, but I think it plays out in, not only in that chapter, but in every phase of life. He says this, he says, the lamp or the light of the body is the eye. And if your eye is singular, that means if it's focused, your whole body will be full of light. Now, listen, remember what light, knowledge, darkness, ignorance. Now follow me on this. He's not really speaking of your physical eyes, but he's speaking of the perception and how you see life. What, is the, what are the patterns of thinking, the belief system that drives how you walk, carry out your life, how you view people, how you view God, how you view yourself? But then, here's what makes it very interesting. On in there, he says, if the light that is in you be darkness, now follow this. If it be darkness, if it is darkness. Now listen, light, knowledge, darkness, ignorance. But he just called light darkness. So in other words, if the light that is in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? In other words, make sure that what you've perceived to be true is not ignorance, is not a lie. How many of us are, man, how many of us are walking around? We learned this from, you know, over here or that church back yonder, or, you know, from, you know, grandma, or mom, or, or dad. And, and the fact is this, is, is it from them, or is, is it from the Word? How many of us have just been raised up with a pattern of thinking that we have just, we have embraced it as truth, and we would die for it? We would, we would argue for that. And yet, at the same time, we, we haven't taken the time to let the, man, the exposed, unadulterated word, expose and actually offend us if we are wrong. So the thing that I want you to see today is that the war is going on here in your mind. That's why Paul said that we are to pull down strongholds, that we are to cast down arguments and every high thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God. And we are to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 
What does Christ mean? Anointing. The obedience of the anointing. The obedience of what is already stirring in you, but you've got to allow the lid to come off. The point is, is make sure that every thought that you allow to stay in your mind is subject to who God says that you are. That's the most important thing. And then just let me leave you just one last thing here. In verse 6, look at this. It says, and being ready, I love these words, to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. In other words, when you decide to be obedient to God's word and and take him at his word and just go forth in faith, believing that what he says is true, then you have the authority, you are empowered to yank down anything that would be in opposition, but not just to cast it down, but to punish that sucker. In other words, in other words, I, how dare you? Uh, you what do you get from that guy? Uh, I mean, you, you, can, you start fighting it. No, you, you can punish it. You have that kind of authority. It's, it's that kind of mindset that I believe if the, if the church at large would grab a hold of and understand that that's what we possess by the authority of the word, not just in the book, but the book in us. Oh, church, man, that's where things start to go. Because now when you realize how God wants you to think, then you will be able to spot and you'll be able to identify any contrary thought. And in a second, you can yank that thing down and it does not have a place in your life. So now, here's where you're at. You come to a place where you're sitting here today. Maybe you're watching online right now and you're hearing, you, you're hearing this and you're saying, okay, but you don't know what he did to me. You, 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 don't, you don't know it, what, how it affected my life. You don't know it, at, at what that did. You don't know, you know, my upbringing, my culture. You don't know what I had to deal with and go through. Listen, I don't have to know. I know everything hasn't been perfect. I get it. I know it. But what are you choosing to habitate in? What are you choosing to put roots down in? Are you going to sit there and continually regurgitate that situation and what they said and how they treated you and and what was unfair and and that just wasn't right and you know everybody else gets all the breaks and if they only knew and I'm not loved and nobody cares and and you move in and you start feeling depressed and defeated and trying to get somebody to notice you and you know so they can come to your aid what about if somebody has already noticed you what if the Holy Spirit It says, I got you, I got you. If you will just, if you will just renew your mind to what the Father says about you, you're not a castaway. You're not defined by that decision you made. Those are mistakes that you made and every time people thought, oh, there they go again, going down the same road, falling off the wagon again. You can't ever trust them. They can't. So you feel like people don't trust you anymore. Can I tell you today that if you choose to let those thoughts be the pattern of thinking for you, you will arrive at the destination of those thoughts. Nothing's ever going to change. As a matter of fact, it'll lead to destruction. But if you're willing, as Jesus says, to go down that narrow way, and it may seem difficult because everybody's not going down that road. It's easier to follow the crowd. It's easier to to go with the masses. Kind of what everybody's saying. It's, ah, I feel like I'm accepted. I feel like they got my, my back. They don't, they're trying to figure out how to cover their own back. But he said, if you go that way, and not many are gonna choose it, but if you do, you will find life everlasting. Your choice, what will you think? Let this mind be in you. 
which is also in Christ Jesus. Just like Paul said, let us have the mind of Christ to hold the thoughts and the feelings and the purposes of his heart. When you take that stance and you reset your mind to that truth, ah, now it's unlimited what God can do through you and in you. Will you bow your heads? Thank you so much for joining the Without Walls YouTube channel today. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a live stream or a video and make sure you share it with a friend. And if you wanna stay connected with all that's going on, make sure you download our app today so you don't miss a thing. We look forward to seeing you soon and have a great week.